<laughs> Is there some event today that class is so thin? I don't know, career fair, anything? Nope. Okay. Um, okay, anyway, uh, questions? Um, in a practical application, is it sensible to have a series of inverters <coughs> connected in a loop? Okay, so what would a series of inverters connected in a loop do? Yeah, it, it has a practical application. And so you could make like a clock out of it. Exactly. So think of uh, odd number of inverters connected in a loop. So kind of like the following. Let me. Let's say we have a circuit like this. And let's say at some point in time, there was a value zero out here. Then after a short while, so, so it became zero. After a short while, this will become one. After a short while, it will become zero. This will become one. And of course, this is connected. So now this is one. So after a short while, this will become zero. This will become one. This will become zero. And so if you look at the waveform, it will kind of like go like this. Okay, and this is useful as a signal to kind of like the heartbeat of our digital system. So we'll talk about it uh, maybe a couple of weeks from now when we kind of start looking at sequential systems. So yes, very useful. So um, this the question that I had was more like, um, if you do do this, would you be dissipating like a lot of energy because you have like an input and an output that are dependent on each other that are kind of like connected together and have different values? No, so firstly, there are no two outputs which are connected out here. Okay, so this, uh, right, I mean, all that's happening is that we are creating a loop, but uh, it's not the case like when I was discussing tri state buffers and I was saying it's a bad idea to have two outputs tied together. That's not what's happening out here. Okay, all that's happening out here is that after a, whenever I set up a value at a particular wire, after a short time, that value flips. So it's just flipping very rapidly. Um, so this is actually a very good way to create on-chip clocks. So on any microprocessor, microcontroller, these kind of chips that you buy, um, uh, it, one way is to give them an external clock. What component provides a clock? Anyone knows? Like what, what kind of electronic components are used to supply a clock? Uh, crystal oscillators, okay. Uh, what, what does the term crystal refer to there? Why is it called crystal oscillator? Someone else? Quartz crystal. Why? What, what's special about quartz crystal? Yeah, so piezoelectric. Anyone from this side of the room? What does piezoelectric mean? No one? Piezoelectric? Physics? No? Any? Okay, this side of the room. Hmm? Say, say, say again? Okay, so piezoelectronic, piezoelectric crystals have the property that if you apply voltage to them, that they form, or if you deform them, they produce voltage, okay, whichever way kind of look at it. So, uh, so they're used in many applications. In this particular case, what happens is that um, you, you cut the crystal in a very precise way and that dictates the frequency with which it oscillates. So resonant uh, resonance, anyone <coughs> recall from physics what resonance means? Resonant frequency? No one? Some strings a bell? Heard of it at least? Okay, so take a wild guess. What does resonance mean? Yeah, what does that term resonance mean? So I don't know if you've heard this anecdote that like on a bridge, an army or column of soldiers walking can cause the bridge to begin to vibrate and collapse. This is kind of this old, uh, 
And what happens is that the frequency of motion of the soldiers begins to energize the bridge. Bridge has a natural frequency of oscillation. If the two align, the amplitude starts going up and up and up and up and it crashes. Same thing happens in piezoelectric. Well, it's a sub that if you trigger it just the right way, there's a natural frequency at which it oscillates. And then you pick up that oscillation and you magnify it electronically. And then voila, you are going to have, after some circuit magic, you're going to have a waveform like this. So piezoelectric crystals are very, um, or crystal oscillators, are very commonly used in electronic components. <coughs> Versus these, these can be made in silicon. So they can be put on chip. So uh, why do we have, if we can do this, why do we need crystal oscillators? Okay. Uh, these, like, are useful inside because they're cheap to make, but they're not very precise. A lot of times, they, when you make it off chip, you can mm -hmm. make a lot more precise. Exactly. So the reason they're not very precise is the following. So these uh, uh, inverters, silicon, it's the speed, uh, the delay through the inverters is going to dictate how often I'm the frequency of the signal. And the delay of a gate uh, depends very heavily on temperature, okay? Moreover, it's very hard to make these inverters of just the right size, in the sense the size of the transistors in there affects the delay. And it's very hard to make the transistors to be very precise in size. Just to give you an example, uh, in a modern silicon technology, the, within the dimension of a transistor, you probably have five atoms or so. So one atom error, that, that me, meaning that if you make an error in drawing the transistor of a very tiny amount, can cause a 20% variation or even more, okay? So it's very hard to get electronic circuits which have a very, uh, where at manufacturing time, you can very precisely dictate what the delay is going to be, okay? So these things are essentially flaky. Um, um, they are cheap to make. You can make very fast clocks, but they are, um, and you can put them on silicon, so on the same chip, so you don't have to waste area elsewhere in your system, but uh, they're not very good. So if all you're doing is like, you know, I don't care about the speed of computation, but I just want to compute, this is fine. Uh, but if you want to control the speed with which the computation is happening, then you need a more precise source, and that is what crystal oscillators and other things kind of provide. Um, did you not build a resonator using MEMS technology? You can. You can. Uh, yes, you can, and people are doing it. Uh, there are several companies which have now begun to make um, uh, mechanical structures on silicon, which is what he's referring to. MEMS, anyone knows what MEMS stands for? Micro, electro, mechanical, uh, structures or uh, uh, so it's basically instead of making transistors on silicon you literally make mechanical structures like beams and gears and all these kind of things pretty cool stuff you can do so you can make a tuning fork type structure on silicon and tuning forks are used you might recall your physics experiments and all they're used again they vibrate and you can uh, so using those, you can again create an oscillator structure. So there are companies doing it. Uh, they're not as good yet, quite as good as uh, crystal oscillators, but they're almost there. And so, yes, you certainly can. And there are applications where you need even very precise clocks. So there are companies which are making like chip scale atomic clocks now. They sell for around $1,500. Um, they're tremendously expensive, they cannot be exported, whatnot, but you basically can have an atomic clock on basically a chip size packet. So there's a lot of stuff goes into clocking. So I'll throw out another question, and I, yeah, again, want you to take a shot at it. Why do you think I would like to care about how precise my frequency is? So I'm doing computations, instruction in a computer at a time. And why would I care about that, you know, how pre the precise timing of the instruction? Someone else, come on, guys. It, take a wild guess. Ben, why don't you try? Now that I know your name, I'm going to pick on you. Sorry. <laughs> Is there, can you think of examples of computing where you want to measure time? Sure. So like if you're processing a signal, if I want to measure 
um, I don't know, some sensor saw a target and uh, later on some other sensor saw some other target, so the same target and we want to see how fast the target travel, then I need to have a precise notion of how much time passed. So I cannot afford to have a frequency source whose timing characteristics I do not know very well because I'm going to count it in terms of number of clock cycles and multiply it by the frequency or whatever time period to compute the time. But if the clock source is not very accurate, then my time measurement would not be very accurate. So a lot of computers are used to measure physical quantities or uh, do uh, like uh, forget about targets and all. Take gaming, uh, vi uh, video games and stuff like that. A lot of them have to have realistic physics. Uh, again, good sense of time is important. So many computations require that the frequency, the clock be of some tolerable thing. Whereas if you were to just use these, they can be quite, uh, quite, a, way, quite a way off. So uh, later on, I mean, once we move beyond combinational logic, we will see a lot about clocks and timing and stuff like that. Uh, but I guess long winded answer to the thread you started. So inverters can be used to make clocks and clocks are tremendously useful. Um, in fact, without that, you really cannot do any modern computing uh, because in the absence of a clock, I'll have to map my entire computation into a single piece of combinational logic and that's it and that's not very flexible. So it takes us only so far. Okay, more questions. Anyone else? Anything to do with, yeah, go ahead. What kind of frequencies do they typically operate at? Or if it's, uh, if it's really high, how do you code it down to operate? Okay, so how, what frequency do PCs operate at? Anyone? Come on, this side, you must have bought a computer. How fast this one? Yeah. Yeah, so what, how, what, what computer do you have? PC, okay, Intel processor in it. How many gigahertz? 4.0, wow, you have a uh, high-end stuff, okay. My Mac is, uh, this thing is I think 2.3 gigahertz. Okay, so that's the free clock at which the circuitry inside the processor is operating at. Your clock source are not at that. Crystals cannot oscillate at that many gigahertz. So crystal oscillators, they usually are in tens of megahertz, maybe 100 megahertz at most. These things can operate very fast, okay? They can go into, because they're on chip, uh, a typical inverter may have a delay of a few picoseconds, so I can tie it up together and get into multiple uh, multiple gigahertz very rapidly, but it would not be a very good clock, as we kind of talked about. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so clock sources are usually, uh, at least in cases of these multi gigahertz type systems, they are much lower, so you have to multiply the clock. And those of you who are EE students, uh, you might see it in some advanced course, there's these things called phase lock loops, these are circuits which can multiply frequency. And there are also circuits which can divide frequency, so divide, division is easy, in fact you'll probably see it in this class, uh, but multiplication is much harder. So, but you can do it. So which is how like on a PC, you may have a 40 megahertz crystal oscillator, but your processor is operating at four gigahertz in his case. So you have to multiply it by like a huge factor. Okay. So um, yeah, and, and if you look at like, uh, um, like a typical mobile <laughs> phone, for example, it probably has maybe around 10 or so crystal oscillators doing different things. Uh, very precise one for the GPS because it is measuring distances and has to therefore measure time of flight of the uh, radio signal very precisely. Uh, it will have one for the processor, it's from you know, a bunch of others. Uh, there are several radios, each one of them needs its own clock source. So there's a whole bunch of things kind of out there, um, in, even in a tiny system like this. So, okay, more questions?
See, the more you ask, the less I'll cover on the formal side of the course, so midterm would be easier. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll talk about it later, but the frequency that you have, if it is too fast, then the combinational part of the circuit, which really does the work, cannot finish its computation. So the frequency, or rather time period of a clock has to be slow enough so that all the combinational part uh, of the circuit settles down. That's kind of the basic thumb rule. We'll go into the details later, in, way towards the end of the class, of course. More questions? So the limiting factor usually the speed of the combination logic? This and the wires. I think I mentioned once earlier that um, wires take a lot of delay uh, because of they have capacitance and all. So, yeah. so both of them. Yeah. In fact, I think, uh, so again, I don't do chip design and all, but my guess is in current technologies, wire delay probably dominates. Gate delay of the gates is less than the delay of the wires. Yeah, you go ahead. Um, in one of the cases, or one of the problems we learned in March, mm -hmm. we had a Boolean algebra that took place of situation of non compression. Mm -hmm. Can you divide the term in the discussion of the Boolean? What do you mean by divide? There is a concept of Boolean division which I have not covered. Is, is it like A and C equals A and C? Can you divide A and C? No. 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 I mean, generally, no. For this, yeah. Okay. So, um, I guess since we're in the homework uh, topic, you had a problem saying um, how to use last inverters, like these two inverters, mm -hmm. um, to invert pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of point out how that would be done? <laughs> I will point it out. There was one student, uh, Paulina. Yeah, okay, so she did it. She was told, uh, okay, so I mean, she found a paper uh, describing the approach. There are E Times articles describing the approach. I'll send them around so you can read it. Uh, in fact, it turns out that if I give you K signals, then you need log 2K inverters. Okay, but the circuit is humongously complicated, even for this little one. Okay, so it's not anything practical, it's just exploring something about, you know, like truly, like how many inverters we really, really need. Okay, it's just exploring that. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll post it on Piazza. That's it. Okay, so let's move on. So uh, I guess what we have been doing is to go through more and more complicated modules and kind of how they work. Uh, I guess towards the end, I was talking about that how you can uh, once you have these modules, you can kind of think of design. Uh, given a problem specification, you can kind of think about as if you are. Uh, coming up with an algorithm and then mapping it into these modules. Okay, much like when you are writing software, you kind of first think about like, you know, what are decompose the problem. So like in this case, computing maximum, we kind of bro broke it down into first compare and then select one of the two depending upon the comparison. And that kind of boils down to a magnitude comparator and a mux. So that was one of the examples I'd covered. I'd also presented this very powerful kind of module called read-only memory, which is, so memory is nothing but like a table, an array, in which uh, there is an index, which is like the address, and then each, each position in the array holds a value and you index into this array and you get back the value, okay? And uh, literally you can kind of put your truth table into it where the address corresponds to the row number of the truth table that you are interested in and the value that comes out at the output is whatever output value that, that you want in that bit location and it could be in, in that address and it could be multiple many, many bits. So um, I talked about like how, so I can implement literally any com any combinational function. If I give you a um, uh, n input b output rom, then it has two to the power n slots in it. So it's basically capable of implementing a truth table with two to the power n rows. And then in each slot, I have b bits of output. So I'm basically implementing a function which has a b bit output in it. Um, uh, the reason ROMs or these kind of structures are useful is because they can be implemented in a very compact way on, on silicon. Uh, and so 
conceptually kind of the idea was that I can take two of the modules we have previously seen, a decoder where I take the address and then I got a one hot coded thing. So I, since I have n inputs coming in, I basically now get a line which basically is activated corresponding to which, uh, which um, uh, location in the memory I'm interested in. So I have zero through two to the power n minus one. And then in each location, what this line does is it basically activates a tri-state buffer. Uh, at the input of the tri-state buffer, I arrange to put the right value out there. And I take the output and uh, feed it out. Um, uh, sort of all these tri-state buffers are tied together and their output kind of goes, goes out, out there. Now, if n was very large, like for example, uh, nowadays you can buy uh, DRAMs which may have, I don't know, I think the bigger DRAMs are now what, 64 gigabit uh, type thing, so they have a lot of address lines. So if you were to just do it this way, you will have like a lot of tri-state buffers kind of in a, in a line like this and that's not very good. So simply from laying things out on silicon, kind of putting it, putting them down, it turns out to be more efficient to, instead of a single linear array, to think of a two-dimensional array where some address bits are used to select which row of my array I'm going into and then other address bits select which column I'm interested in. So what's happening out here is I have a decoder out here and whose output basically say which row of memory locations I'm selecting. So it basically if you see like W0 goes into this entire top row of tri-state buffers. So if the address was zero, then all these tri-state buffers in the very first row are going to be activated. They're going to output their value on these vertical wires. So like uh, the very top left tri-state buffer is going to output put its value on this vertical wire. The second uh, uh, one in the top row is going to put the second wire. And remember all these other tri-state buffers and other rows, they are off because W0 is on and all the other WIs are low. So all the tri-state buffers in one row are driving their corresponding vertical lines. And each vertical line, uh, each tri-state buffer is 16-bit, each vertical line is 16-bit in our example. And then down here I have a multiplexer and I take the other bits of the address and use them to select which column uh, am I selecting? So which which one of these four wires in this diagram whose 16-bit value I'm going to steer to the output. So what this serves is this sort of a row column approach is it kind of gives us a better aspect ratio of the physical design uh, as opposed to something long and vertical, something which hopefully is kind of nicely square or kind of some decent uh, rectangular shape. So often, often we see these kind of structures. Um, the other nice thing is that these, even though I've drawn tri-state buffers, you can actually implement these things with just, uh, for this particular application, you can implement them using a single transistor, which is as simple a circuit as it ever gets. So essentially, at the cost of one transistor per bit, I can create these memory structures, which is extremely efficient, much more efficient than doing equivalent stuff in gates. Uh, so I can store large amounts of data uh, in a very small amount, but and flash memories and all kind of conceptually operate kind of in somewhat analogous fashion. So if you do that instead of one transistor per bit, that's that's a like a at the time that you manufacture the chip, the data is set, right? You can't, you can't modify it. Depends. So so uh, so so in there are certainly ROMs where the value at the input out here is set at manufacturing time. Okay, so you literally tie the input to power supply or to ground. Okay, but you can also imagine putting in, instead of a plain wire, putting in a fuse there. And uh, that fuse, or kind of like a, imagine like a switch, where then with some special mechanism, you can connect it to zero or one after it has been manufactured. So there are these kind of ways as well. So they are, they get into, I guess, last time someone had mentioned field programmable gate arrays, so they kind of begin to look like that. So think of them as, field programmable ROMs. Huh? Yeah, e e yeah, so EPROMs are like that, exactly. No, so there are fuses also which can revert back to state. Yeah. It's all kind of kind of materials you are using and stuff like that. Yeah. Questions? Okay, so 
moving on. Uh, so what we saw in this module thus far is decoder, encoder, multiplexer, arbiter, uh, comparator, ROMs. Uh, I talked about that how given a problem specification and we'll be handing out the second design homework pretty soon. Uh, you basically have to kind of uh, decompose your problem into simpler functional modules and then implement if I allow you to use the logism modules, you can use them. If I don't allow you, then each one of the simpler modules you have to implement using gates, okay? So it's all literally, like I think the analogy with software is great. I mean, you sort of break down the problem, think of what your subroutines are, which are these modules, think of how you are gonna write each one of those subroutines. So that's what's happening with there. So in reality, um, would prompts be built using essentially like would you have pages and sort of sections that it dumps at a time, or would it be more a sequential type? There are all types. So there are sequential ones, there are page type ones, there are things which place a limit, like they may say, you can read any location, but whenever you are writing, you have to write a whole page. So that's what how flash memories work, for example. Whenever, in flash memories, you can read any location in the memory randomly, but whenever you are writing, the whole memory, so like, I don't know, like nowadays, what we have a eight gigabyte flash card or whatever. So that eight gig is gonna be divided into a bunch of pages where page may have a few hundred locations. And whenever you're writing to the flash memory, you have to write the whole page. That's how the technology is. So uh, again, uh, almost any variant you can imagine, there's probably some combination of these memories kind of in existence like this. So uh, kind of things I expect at this stage you should be able to uh, do are when faced with kind of an English language description of some functions. So like for example, um, this is an example. There is a card game with four players where each player draws a card. The winner is the player with the highest card according to a particular rule. This is kind of our standard playing card rule. And if there is a tie, then you look at the uh, suit. Uh, to which the card belongs. Design a combinational logic system which will output the highest card. So how would you do this? How would you approach it? Okay, I think you have asked enough questions and answered enough questions. So someone from this side, please. How would you approach this design of a system like this? Yeah. Uh, you just do a series of layers. You just have a module that has like the equal. Mm -hmm. wires that each of them check so what would you compare? So firstly, how would you represent a card? Someone from the back of the room, want to try? Yeah, so. You can represent the number and then the color. Like the color or suit, suit yeah, of the or card, right. Okay, so in this problem, what would be better? So there are 52 cards in the deck. So I can represent them using six bits. Or. Uh, right, one through fifty-two, or uh, alternatively, I can represent the number numeric value of the card separately. That's four bits, and the suit of the card separately. That's two bits. So it's either case six bits, but it's just that I'm allocating it differently. Which scheme is better? How about you? Want to take a shot? Uh, no, you. <laughs> uh. Okay, so second one is better. I was asking you, by the way. Yeah. yeah, but anyway, so you're going to answer me the next step. So, okay, so he says it's the second one is better. I'll have two bits of suit, four bits of number. Now I want to find the winner. How would you do it? You want to try? Right, so let's expand upon further. What for? Uh, so what am I trying to do? I have to first follow this rule, right? So how, what, what, what mo functional module lets me do the first thing? I have two cards. I want to find which one is bigger, right? So I have two six-bit values. The six-bit values have four bit of number, two bit of suit, right? So that's my card. And I have two such cards. First, I have to evaluate the first one. So what, what module would you use? So let's continue with you. So what module do you think you'll use? 
what does this less than suggest of it's a magnitude comparator right so i'll use a magnitude comparator of four bits to compare that numeric value now the output of this magnitude comparator could either be true or false if it is true that is card one card is bigger than the other card i have my winner and that card should be dumped to the output so i'll have some sort of a multiplexer to do that if that one is false then i have to do i have to figure this out so i have to do another comparison so now this could be done using another comparator a two bit comparator and uh, then that will tell me uh, which card to put at the output so um, based upon this could would anyone like to kind of think of what the overall circuit could look like yeah so this is the only one mm -hmm. it, it might be easier to like set up perspective Okay, so you're suggesting kind of a smart solution. You're basically saying, why not just assign them numeric value which basically corresponds to their right order, right? Sure, you could do that. You could do that, so you can use a six-bit comparator also. So same problem, depending upon data representation, you can approach many different ways. Okay, so uh, faced with these kind of things, so uh, you should kind of, the idea is that English language descriptions, translate them into combinational logic. Okay, that's what you would face. Uh, this, okay, so uh, let's kind of move on. So um, next type of, and uh, for now the final kind of combinational modules that we are going to cover are uh, arithmetic modules, which. are the other type of functions which uh, we use quite a bit. So uh, in computers, besides all doing all these comparisons and decoders and stuff like that, we also perform arithmetic. So let's see how that can be done. And that also begs the question, how do we represent numbers? So thus far, we have seen that we can represent positive numbers in the standard binary way. I'm going to do a quick uh, recap over that, but then we also have to deal with negative numbers and stuff like that. And the question then becomes, how can we do that? How do we deal with those? So let's let's talk about that. Um, so, uh, so, so let's start with representing numbers. So uh, if I am dealing with non-negative integers, uh, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 onwards, then essentially the notation we have been using thus far could be used. So we basically think of, um, bit numbers, uh, bit position, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, like this would be a 5-bit number. And then each position has a weight. Uh, so this is exactly like the way our decimal system works, that each digit position has a weight. So in this case, um, this has a weight of 1, the next position is a weight of 2, 4, 8, 16. The analogy is decimal 1, where the weights are 1, 10, 100, 1000, so and so forth. So uh, we are operating in terms of those. So let's take this number, 11001. Uh, if I want to find its numeric value, what does it correspond to? So then I each bit position, which is 1, uh, it contributes whatever is a weight. So in this case, it's going to be 16 plus 8 plus 1. So that's 25. So uh, that gives us the weight and gives us a number. Okay. So the question then becomes, how can I represent other kinds of numbers? Okay. So and uh, if you think of like again, code that you may have written, or just generally in our life, numbers that we deal with, we often have to deal with signed numbers. We have to deal with real numbers. Real numbers, um, in the, uh, in the real number lines, so or they have. Uh, fractional parts and all, okay, we may, may want to represent fractions and imaginary numbers and uh, all, side, all, 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 all different kind of numbers. So we have to find ways to uh, express those. And just like early in the course, we saw that the same information when represented differently facilitates um, certain operations to be done more easily than others. So it could be that representing these numbers in some ways 
makes my logic easier. Like maybe multiplier becomes easier if I represent numbers one way versus another. Uh, so uh, we'll kind of see how those are done. So uh, conversion thing. So like if I have uh, so so this kind of stuff you have to become very converse very very comfortable with. Okay. So if I have a number in base ten, I want to convert the number into binary base. So what we can what you start doing is you divide it by so you kind of start from the most significant bit so like we basically say you know um, 17 divided by 2 remainder 1 uh, uh, so, so it's 8 remainder 1 so it's basically uh, and each time we kind of take the next one uh, we have 8 uh, divided by 2 4 remainder 0 we kind of continue this process and we get all the numbers. So it's basically what it's saying is the following, that um, how many, uh, um, uh, if, so, so think about this, if the number is odd, um, it is uh, always going to have a least significant bit of one. If the number is even, it would have a least significant bit of uh, zero. So when I'm taking this number and I'm dividing it by two, I'm actually discovering the least significant bit out here. And then the remaining number that 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 leaves out here, it's uh, so my uh, so you can think of your number as eight times two plus one. So this eight is now has a higher place value, right? It has a place value of two. So eight times two, and then this one is my least significant bit. I play the same game with eight. I try to find its lowest bit, except that this lowest bit will have a weight of two. So I do eight divided by two, that gives me a four, remainder of zero, and I kind of continue this particular process. So multiple, uh, whatever, repeated divisions by two are going to gradually give me the bits of this number starting from uh, the least significant side. So in this case, one zero zero one triple zero one is kind of the number 17. Um, okay. Now, uh, decimal to binary is um, uh, yeah, can often yield very long strings. So usually what happens is uh, instead of representing numbers in binary, we often represent numbers in a higher power of two. Um, and a very common one is to represent numbers hexadecimal. So for example, uh, so, so, so uh, hexadecimal means I am dealing with base 16, no longer. Uh, so then we, that begs the question, how do I represent the digits in this uh, new base? So 0 through 9 represents a 0 through 9, but then A, B, C, D, E, F represents the digits corresponding to 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. If I'm dealing with base K, then my digits go from 0 through K minus 1 base 10, 0 through 9, base 2, 0 through 1. So the digits always go from 0 through k minus 1, where k is the base. Uh, uh, so, uh, so hexadecimal numbers correspond to 0, 1, 2, 3 through f. These are the digits of the hexadecimal. And there are 16 values, so you can think of them as they are representing 4 bits, because 4 bits represent 16 values. So each hexadecimal digit corresponds to four bits. So my binary number originally, which would might be very long, now suddenly shrinks in terms of writing, shrinks by a factor of four. So for example, uh, 1963 to the base 10, if you convert it into base zero, it will look like 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and that's in base two. And then to convert it into hexadecimal, I start grouping in four from the right hand side. So the first group of four is one zero one one. Next group of four is one zero one zero, and final group of four is one one one. And then we prepend a zero to it. So zero one one one, and we write it down. So it becomes a number seven a b hex. In software, how do we write seven, uh, a hexadecimal number? Anyone <coughs> done it? I see a lot of hands, but no new hands. Come on. I'm sure we are required, all required to do programming classes. So how about we try on this side? How do we write hexadecimal number in a Java code, C++ code, C code, wherever? OK, this time I'm going to pick on you. So 0x. Um, zero 0x, zero yeah. 
Please speak up, guys. Come on. Okay, so we write 0x. So 0x 7ab. That's a way of writing hexadecimal number. Uh, uh, how do we write binary numbers in a C program? No, I think you are banned from answering for now. So anyone in the back of the room, how do I write binary numbers in a C, C++, Java program? Then B, small b number. Base 8 is called octal. Okay. How uh, digits of base 8? What would the digits of base 8 be? Back of the room again. Base 8 numbers. What will be the digits of a base 8 number? No. 0 to 7. It's always 0 to k minus 1. Okay. And since there are eight of them, so they correspond to three bits. So to get base eight, you get the binary number and do grouping of three. Uh, in programs, this less used, so I'll not ask it. It's a little o. So a little o followed by a number represents octal numbers. So there are many ways of writing the same number. Yeah, go ahead. Would also have... uh, there is no particular use to support it. I mean, yeah, I think it's much less so used. So binary and hexadecimal are kind of the more common one. Yeah. In, in, in what? Uh, okay, so. Oh, yeah, you're right, because there are groups of three. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so there you have it. Okay, so we have a Linux expert here. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, now let's talk about how we can do additions, um, additions of binary numbers. So if I have two one-bit numbers, the addition is part is easy. 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, zero, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, which is a number 1, 0, or you can think of it as 0 with a carry of 1 to the next position, okay? Just like in case of decimal numbers, we kind of do the same thing, and by the time we start adding things like 6 plus 6, we begin to have a carry, right? So the same same logic which is appearing out here. Multi-bit numbers. So how can we add those? So let's say I want to add 6 and 3 uh, in binary. So 6 and 3 in decimal, 6 plus 3 is 9. In binary is 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. How am I going to add it? Thoughts? Anyone? So try to rec recall how we add uh, decimal numbers and kind of do the same same thing analogously out here. So how do we add a multi-digit decimal number? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Got right, Good. So tell me. So what will happen out here? So I have uh, zero and one. one. Good. What's the carry? So the carry here is zero. Okay. Um, carry of one. Yeah. And carry of one, which essentially feeds out here. And you can see is one zero zero one, which is nine. Okay. So that's how we add these these numbers. Okay. So that spares me the animations. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Another number, I'm um, 1 plus 1, 0, carry of 1. Uh, now we have 1 plus 0 plus 1, so I'm adding three 1 bit numbers. So 1 plus 0 plus 1 is going to be 0 with a carry of 1. Then I'm adding 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 1 with a carry of 1. So my final output is 1100, zero, zero, which you can verify is the number 12 as one would expect. So uh, that brings the question if I'm adding two n bit numbers, how many bits do I need to represent the sum? Yeah, n plus 1. Uh, why is that? So take the analogy again with decimal numbers. If I'm adding two two-digit numbers, I may need three digits for the output, right? Like 99 plus 99 cannot be represented in two digits. So it's always, when adding two n-bit numbers, I, the sum may need an extra digit, extra bit. OK. Uh, so um, 
So what's happening is at each at each bit position, I'm adding three one bit numbers and I'm getting two outputs. I'm getting a sum output and I'm getting a carry output. So you can think of in combinational logic terms, you can say that each, at each bit, I'm implementing a function with three inputs. Two of them are my bits and the third one is the carry coming in from the previous bit. And then I'm generating two outputs. One is the sum bit and the other is a carry out bit. Okay, so it's a function that I have to implement which has three one bit inputs and two one bit output. So you can represent it as a truth table. So let's call it, I'm looking at the ith position. AI and BI are the two bits of the two numbers A and B. Uh, I will have uh, uh, why, have, uh, why have I written output out here? Okay. This is all messed up. Okay, so think of it like I have CI means carry coming into the ith bit. CI plus 1 means carry going out of the ith bit and going into the i plus 1th bit. So my truth table is going to look like if I have 0, 0, 0, then the sum is 0 as well as the carry out is 0. Again, this is CI. And the complete truth table, I'm going to just skip through this, is going to look like this. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm messing it up. Okay, let me go back. Okay. So what's happening out here is the following. I'm actually first trying to add only two bits numbers in this truth table. So I'm ignoring any carry in coming in. So I have AI and BI, and so I have four possibilities. Uh, AI and BI could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And so that would give me an output of 0 or 1, 1, or finally 2. So if I'm just adding two one bit numbers, that means I can think of it as a sum of 0, 1, 1, 0, and a carry out of 0, 0, 0, and 1 in this particular case. This type of addition will only happen at the least significant bit, at, because at the least significant bit, I don't have any carry coming in. I only have two bits to add. This function is called a half adder. So a half adder is a combinational module which takes two one bit numbers and produces a sum bit and a carry bit. Looking at this, what do you think is a Boolean expression uh, or uh, uh, how would you implement the carry out? What gate would correspond to the carry out function uh, or CI plus one function? So that's an AND gate. So it's a two input AND gate. So this I can implement using AND2. What is this guy? 0, 1, this is XOR, right? So a uh, half adder is basically an AND gate and an XOR gate. Any questions on that? Okay, so in terms of blocks, it, we would write it as the following, that is a module, we call it half adder, HA. It's a one bit half adder in the sense that uh, each input is a one bit number. Uh, so A, B, and sort of C and S are the outputs, and this is kind of a logic implementation of that. Okay. Now, what happens in the higher bit position? So in the higher bit position, not only do I have the A and B bit, but I also have a carry coming in. So I'm adding three one bit numbers. So in that particular case, my truth table will look something like this. I will take zero, 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 so I have a carry in of 0, A and B are both 0. So in that case, my output is going to be numeric value 0, which you can think of it as sum of 0 and carry out of 0. Let's look at another one. So let's look at, for example, this guy, this row, where carry coming in is 1. I have 0 and 0. So 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1, numeric value 1, which you can think of it as a sum bit of 1 and a carry out of 0. 
take this case where carry in is 1 and A and B are also 1. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. Uh, its sum bit is going to be 1 and its carry bit is also going to be 1. So looking at this one, uh, now this is a more complicated circuit and this is called a full adder. So full adder corresponds to higher bits. It takes three one bit numbers and outputs a sum and a carry. So uh, the expression here is obviously more complicated. Uh, so, 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 so let's look at it, what's happening out here. Uh, let's look at the sum. So when is sum high? Well, sum is high when the input is 0, 0, 1 or 0, 1, 0 or 1, 0, 0 or 1, 1, 1. Do you see any pattern to it? Mm. Why don't you answer blue? Yeah. Uh, the choice no, that's not true because sum is high even though I have zero zero one. Yeah. Like there's there's there has to be a no ones to the left of it. No ones to the left of it? To the left of where the one is. Well, that's not true out here. One one one. Any, you want to answer? Whenever there is an odd number of ones. And uh, right, I mean, I have 0, 0, 1, that's a single one. 0, 1, 0, that's only 1, 1. 1, 0, 0, only 1, 1. And 1, 1, 1, only uh, 3 ones. Okay, so odd number of ones. And that's an XOR gate. It's a 3 input XOR gate. Um, it also looks like you could have uh, for the right column you can have an XOR gate and run that through an inverter if you have uh, the first your two CIs through the first gate output through an inverter. You're saying you can run it through an XOR gate so okay. I get an XOR gate and then what do you want to do? And then um, if C is one then we just uh, invert that output. Okay, but that's an another XOR gate basically. An XOR gate also has a property that if one input is uh, uh, high, then the other input is in inverted to the output. This is what I'm saying. A XOR B, if A is one, then A XOR B is B bar. So all you're describing is a two input XOR gate feeding into a two input XOR gate, which is nothing but a three input XOR gate. <laughs> Okay. Looking at the, uh, did you get that part right? I mean, I can, this circuit, this gate is the same as Okay, so what about the carry out, the CI plus one? What circuit it looks like? So uh, let's see, it is one when it is zero one one or one zero one or one one zero or one one one. And this corresponds to the function we saw very early in the course, the majority function. That is when majority of the inputs are one, then the output is one. So this is XOR and this is majority. So the implementation ends up looking, I think my PDF is rather messed up here. Okay, so it ends up looking like this, that A, B, and C in, or C, I, we feed it into a majority circuit, and that goes into C out, and XOR is a three input XOR. And majority we saw before, it is sort of you and pairwise and kind of or them together. Okay, so majority circuit is A and B or B and C or A and C, as we saw long, long ago in the class. Okay, so this is what the majority circuit looks like. So that ends up giving me my overall, uh, uh, that ends up giving me uh, this plus the three input XOR gate or 
two two input XOR gate chained together that give me my full full adder. So as you can see, full adder is pretty complicated. It probably is going to take uh, what four, uh, maybe around eight to ten gates, around twenty transistors. So it's a reasonably complicated uh, thing, and I have to pay this cost for each bit out there. I could also implement a full adder using two half adders. So remind me, what does a half adder do? Anyone, you want to answer? No, no, I use it at two least significant bit, but what, what does the operation of a half adder, what does it do? It adds two one bit numbers, right? A half adder adds two one bit number, gives me the sum and the carry out. So if I give you three one bit numbers to add, what I can do is first add two of them, get a sum, uh, uh, now I'm getting a, um, a sum and a carry, and then I can add them together. So let's see how that will work. This is what I'm proposing. So I, add, I take A and B, I add them together, okay, mm -hmm. using the half adder. So it will give me a carry and it's going to give me a sum bit. I take this sum bit and now I use another half adder uh, to which I feed the carry in. And now uh, what this would give me is uh, sum bit. So this sum out here is going to represent uh, the A plus B plus C in. And then I'm going to get two of these outputs out here. And if either one of them is true, it's a carry out, which is one. So let's see why it works out, okay? Let's say, let's take the case that, so I'm going to go A, B, C in, P, G, C, P, S, and C out. So let's look at it. So if A, B, and C in are all zero, what is P? Why don't you answer? Zero. What's G? Anyone back rows? Okay, I think I want to start picking on. Uh, uh, yeah, why don't you answer? The student right in front of Salma. Yeah. What is going to be G? There are only two possibilities. You can, <laughs> guess will get you 50%. So, zero. Okay, good. G is zero. Okay, what is CP? So remember, CP is the signal. So, CP corresponds to P and C in going into the half adder. Zero. What is going to be S? And uh, finally, C out is zero. Okay, let's try some other number. So this was simple, obviously. Let's try the number one, zero, one. Okay, so I'm first adding one and zero. So what P will I get? So P and G are basically the carry and the, sorry, the sum and the carry thing. So, so I'm getting a P of one and zero. Okay, now, so P is 1, carry in is 1. So what S will I get? Let's try S first. 0, and what CP will I get? 1, and then finally, what's the C out? So if CP is, CP and, uh, sorry, so CP and G is 1 and 1 or 0, which is 1. Okay, and that makes sense because I'm adding 1 plus 0 plus 1. It should have a sum of 0, which is what we're getting. And it should have a carry of one that we are getting also. Okay. Now, uh, and you can try it. Uh, same thing to kind of convince yourself that it works. Now, the way it kind of to think about it is the following: that what's happening out here is the P and G. Why uh, they actually have a particular reason why they are called P and G. P stands for propagate, and G stands for um, generate. Okay. So it's basically. Uh, 
what it is trying to do is the following. It's basically saying that under what condition uh, is a carry going to be generated by these two bits. So if A and B are 1 and 1, then irrespective of whatever C in is, I will always have a carry out. So you can say that A and B, if they are both high, then they are generating a carry. So that's the generate part. C means that if P is high, then C in is going to be propagated. So if P is high and C in is high, then also I'm going to generate a carry, uh, I'm going to have a carry going out. So which is why uh, this CP stands for carry which has been propagated. And this S, if you think about it, the S in the half adder was coming out of an XOR gate. It was A XOR B. And then this S out here in the second half adder is A XOR B XOR C in, which is what my uh, three input XOR looks like. So this whole circuit is really an implementation of a full adder. So two half adders followed by an OR gate gives me a full adder. Or you can do it kind of in terms of the gates that we saw before. So that equivalent really. If you go into Loisim, you will see that it has a half adder module and it has a full adder module. And in fact, it also has a adder, n bit adder also. So full adder, half adder, they're very useful. And one thing I would really like you to get comfortable with is this notion of that depending upon where I'm using these adders, they are adding together numbers of different weights, okay? So normally when I'm adding two binary numbers, I'm gonna put a half adder in the least significant bit, and I'm gonna put full adders in all the successive higher bits. So I can construct an n bit entity rel relatively easily using that, okay? So again, I'm gonna skip through the next few slides because we just went through that logic, okay? Now, this full adder is such an incredibly important module uh, in basically most of digital design because adder is at the heart of uh, so many things we do in our software and also adder is at the heart of things like uh, multiplication, division, all, all of these things end up depending upon addition and multiplication deep down. So implementing addition very efficiently is extremely important and moreover we add many, many bits. So for example, if you look at modern processors, they are 64-bit processors, so they're adding 64-bit numbers. And uh, uh, so um, we're talking about a module which has a half adder and 63 full adders, okay? That's, that's a, and we need many, many of these all over our, uh, all over our chips. So a uh, lot of highly optimized implementations are done. This is an example uh, of an implementation, which I will not sort of walk through out here, but you can, con if you kind of work through it, you would see that it indeed acts like a full adder, okay? Uh, this particular thing is optimized for implementation using CMOS, which is kind of the currently dominant way of designing circuits in silicon, um, you would, um, uh, it turns out that these patterns that you are seeing, things like this pattern, which is two gates back to back, or this pattern, which is again two gates back to back, or this pattern, two gates back to back, these can be implemented very efficiently in CMOS, okay? You don't actually need two gates, you just can do it in a single gate. So, uh, without going into details of this, point basically I want to bring out was that a um, lot of effort people have put into creating highly optimized uh, circuit realizations of adders because it's just such an incredibly important uh, module in digital systems. Uh, now multi-bit adder, so what do we do? Kind of intuitively we've already gotten the hang of it. I'm going to use a half adder in the least significant bit. So because all there is no carry in there, and then I'm going to use full adder in all the other bits. And each full adder is going to take the carry output from the previous bit and feed a carry output to the, uh, to the next bit up. Um, what is bad about this adder? Someone from the back? Do you, do you see anything kind of potentially problematic in, in, in an adder like this. 
we, we saw this kind of stuff before also, last lecture actually. Your answer? Yeah. A lot of time. Why is that? Anyone from the side? Why, why would, so a lot of time is correct. Why do you think it will take a lot of time? Yeah, there's a long chain, right? When this signal changes, we have to go all through this, right? So I have to go through all the bits. So um, if I look at my previous slide, going from C in to C out seems to be going through an inverter and kind of this complex gate. And then I'm going through as many stages as number of bits. So if I was 64 bit adder, then I'm going through 64 times two gate delays roughly. 128 gate delays, that's a lot of delay, okay. So, I mean, I, in some applications, it's fine, but in other applications, maybe you need a faster design potentially also. And uh, so, one way to think about how people create faster adder, okay, is the following. So, I'm going to make, make it by way of analogy. Let's say I want to and a lot of variables, okay. So I want to do A and B and C and D through and Z. And I only give you a two input AND gate. So one way I could do it is like this. I take A and B, I AND them together, feed it into another AND gate, AND it with C, feed it to another AND gate, AND it to D, and keep doing this. In this case, the delay is going to be this long chain, okay? Can you do it faster? It's like a tree. So I can do A, B, C, D, Y, Z, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so I'll have a tree of log, log to the base 2 number, binary tree structure. That's what we are creating. You can imagine the same thing for adders, right? I mean, if a, so all that is happening out here is I'm doing a series of addition, right? I'm, First stage is adding A plus B. Next stage is adding A1 plus B1 to that. The next stage is adding A2 and B2 to it, right? So, the, uh, so I can, instead of structuring it like this long chain, I can actually potentially make a tree out of it. I can do pairwise additions and then kind of, again, pairwise additions and kind of create a tree like that. So a structure like that, the path in that from beginning to end is going to be logarithmic as opposed to the entire number of bits. So that would be an example of a very fast circuit, okay? And um, I'm just kind of giving a very hand wavy, this is an example of what hand, wave, hand, hand wavy means, but uh, a hand wavy argument that perhaps I could restructure this so that instead of having a long chain, I can have a tree and reduce the delay. So um, those kind of adders go under some special names that kind of called things like carry look ahead adder and all, but uh, we are not going to go in depth uh, at, at this stage on that. So there are faster ways of making adders also. But this particular one is called carry ripple adder. Why do you think it's called carry ripple? kind of rippling, propagating up, right? The carry starts from the LS least significant bit and it's going to, uh, rippling through kind of the entire circuit, okay? So that's why I call carry ripple adder. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. If I, uh, no, nothing to add here. Okay. So what we have seen thus far is then I can take binary numbers positive binary numbers, I can add them, okay? I can add n-bit positive binary numbers. We saw how through manual computation, you can go from decimal to binary, binary to decimal, that was straightforward, decimal to binary was a bit harder. We talked about hexadecimal, we talked about octal, uh, so kind of these other different kind of bases and all. Um, how would you, so let's say all I gave you an adder, can you do multiplications with it? Well, multiplication is, as we are taught in 
whatever grade one multiple additions right so i can make a multiplier by doing repeated additions okay um, divisions are a bit tricky because to do divisions we do have to do subtraction and we haven't done subtraction yet okay so next thing up subtraction so what is subtraction subtraction is addition where the second operand is negative right so if a minus b is the same as a plus minus b so it all boils down to then is finding a way to represent negative numbers also right so that's what we are going to do next which is how do we represent negative numbers now how do you think we can represent negative numbers any suggestions so thus far we saw I can represent positive binary numbers let's say I were to say okay now your task is in your system you have to also represent negative integers any suggestions Okay, so how many people have seen two's complement before? A fair number, but not many have not. So let's go through it. But yeah, so let's talk about that. So how can we do it? There are several ways. So there is something called sign magnitude. Uh, in sign magnitude, what we do is the magnitude part is a po positive binary number, just like what we have been dealing with. But then we add tag along an extra bit, which basically says that whether the number is positive or negative. So zero means positive, let's say, and one means negative. Do you see a disadvantage of this representation? Yeah, so zero is represented two different ways. Okay, so that's a problem, right? So um, both one followed by all zeros and zero followed by all zeros is the same number zero, okay? So it can ca cause confusion. Once complement, so what does once complement stand for? So the idea, and, and there's also something called twos complement, so let's, let's talk about what they look like. So let's say we consider number 23 plus 23 and I want to now represent minus 23, okay? So in sign magnitude form, so, so firstly, 23, the magnitude of 23 is 10111. You can check it because this one is in the 16th place, 16 plus 7, 23. Sign magnitude would mean it would be 0, 10111 for positive 23, and 1 followed by 10111 for minus 23. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I think I may have messed up my slides out here. Now, once complement basically means the following. At each bit position out here, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, I subtract it from 1. Okay, the analogy out here is in decimal notation, there is equivalent thing what we call nines complement. Okay, so if base k, it would be called k minus 1's complement. Okay, so for example, if I, in decimal, if I give you the number 76, then I, it's 9's it's complement is going to be 99 minus 76, which is a number 23. Here we are talking about 1's complement. So what we do is, think of like, I subtract this 10111 from 11111. And that would mean I would have, 1 minus 1 is 0, uh, 1 minus 0 is 1, 0, 0, 0. And that is what we will call as minus 23. Okay. So actually, let me draw it properly. So in one's complement, this number, positive number, is still 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And I will always have a extra bit. Okay. Because I... Uh, I have to be able to rep uh, represent the sign somehow. But instead of representing minus 23 like this, I'm going to subtract the whole thing from uh, 1. So it would re be represented as 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Yeah, that would be minus 23 in one's complement. So we subtract it out. Uh, we'll see shortly why we do it, but right now it's just a matter of definition. 
the final one is two's complement, which actually turns out to be what is used most commonly. And let's talk about how, how it works. So key thing with two's complement is that two's complement makes subtraction super easy. In fact, subtraction and addition look exactly the same thing. Okay. So the idea in two's complement is that we represent a negative number minus x as 2 to the power n minus x. Okay. One's complement is the same as 2 to the power n minus x minus 1. So let's say I have an n bit number. Uh, uh, let's say I give you uh, a 4 bit number, then 2 to the power 4 minus 1 is the number 15. It's all ones. Okay. Whereas 2 to the power 4 is 1 followed by 4 zeros. So uh, in my previous example, let's say I'm looking at this number. 1, 0, 1, 0, uh, this number that we are looking, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Then looking at this 5, 6-bit uh, number, um, the 1's complement, as I said, was really subtracting it out of all 1's. So we take all 1's and subtract my plus 23 out of that, and that's how I was getting minus 23. 2's complement means that I subtract it not out of all 1's, but I subtract it out of 1 followed by a bunch of zeros because 2's complement uh, is defined to be that x is minus x is represented as 2 to the power n minus x. So let's see how it kind of works out as an example. Let's start with this table. So my let's say I'm dealing with 4 bits. So firstly, if I have only four bits and I'm trying to represent both negative and positive numbers, I cannot go to 15 on this. Normally in our positive binary with 0, 0, 0, 0, I would be, uh, sorry, with four bits, I would be able to go from 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, which is the number 15. But here, roughly half the numbers, half the bit patterns are going to be reserved for negative numbers. So what we do is 0, 0, 0, 0 through 0, 1, 1, 1, we reserve them for positive numbers. So uh, you can think of the first bit as being 0 and the remaining three bits indicating the magnitude of the positive number. So like the number 4 is 0, 1, 0, 0. Number 6 is the number 0, 1, 1, 0. Or number 7 is 0, 1, 1, 1. That leaves for me these remaining bit patterns which go from 1, 0, 0, 0 through minus 1, uh, sorry, through 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And this is where we apply our other rule. We are basically saying that minus x is represented as 2 to the power n minus x. So let's look at the number minus 1. I basically claiming that in 2's complement, the number minus 1 is going to be represented by 2 to the power n minus 1. Now what is 2 to the power n in this case? 16, because n is equal to 4, so 16 minus 1, which reduces to 15. So as you see out here, minus 1 is represented as 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, let's look at number minus 6. So 6 is 0, 1, 1, 0. That's 6 in binary, positive 6. But negative 6 is going to be 2 to the power n minus 6 which is 16 minus 6, which is 10 in hexadecimal, sorry, in decimal, which is 1, 0, 1, 0, and that is what you're seeing out here, and so and so forth. Now, uh, what is this uh, 2 to power n minus 1? You can think of it as I'm um, taking my this is 2 to the power n minus 1, sorry, 2 to the power n, uh, and I'm going to be subtracting x out of it. So like if I was looking at the number 4, then I would be subtracting 4 out of it. So that's conceptually what I'm doing, but this wheel kind of gives you a sense of what numbers map to what. What is weird about this mapping? 
does anything stick out in terms of uh, something which is uh, not quite elegant? How about there, someone from that corner? If you look at this mapping of bit patterns to numbers, do you see anything unusual out here? I want that part of the room to wake up. Okay, blue shirt, blue checkered shirt. Yeah, you. What's your name? Juan. Okay. Okay, it jumps to negative eight, but let's ignore the jumping part. Do you see something not quite symmetric in the way we are dealing with negative and positive numbers? Somewhere from this side of the room. What's the most negative number we are representing here? What's the most positive number? Right? So right there, there is a asymmetry, right? It's not avoidable. Uh, it's, it's unavoidable because I have an even number of binary patterns. I have to represent the zero. So I have to make a choice. Either I'm going to be representing more positive numbers or more negative numbers, okay? So in this case, I go to minus eight on one side, but I go to only plus seven on the other side. Um, otherwise, we'll run into the problem which we had with sine magnitude, which is I had two ways of representing zero in sine magnitude. So here I don't face that problem. If I say that I give you a four bit pattern and I say it represents a two complement number, and I ask you, is the number represented by it negative or positive, what would you do? Back, yeah. First bit, right? First bit tells me whether the number is negative or positive. So that's nice. It's kind of like sine magnitude in that regard, right? The first bit tells me what, uh, what it is. Um, If I were to ask you what is the magnitude of this number, so again I give you four bits and I say this is a two complement number and I ask you what is the magnitude of this number, what would you do? So this is, this is harder obviously. Okay, so let's say the number is positive, then what's the magnitude? The remaining bits, right? You exclude the sign bit, the remaining bits is that. What if the number is negative? What would you do? <clears throat> you convert into positive. So how do I convert into positive? Well, I have to take, essentially I take the negative of the number, right? I mean, if I, uh, if I have the number minus x, then if I negate it, then I would get back my corresponding positive number. And we saw how to negate a number. Negative x is to the power n minus x, right? So I basically take its two's complement again, and I would be good to go, right? So like, for example, I look at the number uh, minus 5, which is represented as 1011. So what I have to do is I have to negate it to get back my pattern which would be for plus 5. Now this is where a trick often helps. So remember for 2's complement we have defined it as 2 to the power n minus x, right? This guy. I can write this thing as 2 to the power n minus 1 minus x plus 1, right? Mathematically equivalent. What is this guy? Well, firstly, what is 2 to the power n minus 1 looks like? What would be the bit pattern for it? Uh, let's say n was 4. What is 2 to the power 4 minus 1? All 1s. 2 to the power n minus 1 will always be all 1s. Okay? And 
I described some time earlier, all ones minus x, what is that? Ones complement, right? So in effect, this is ones complement. So it's basically saying take, take the ones complement and add one to it, okay? Let's go back to our slide out here. I wanted to take, find, um, I gave you 1011 and I'm asking you what's the magnitude for this? So what we do is we take the ones complement, which is 0, 1, 0, 0, and we add plus 1 to it, which would be 0, 1, 0, 1, voila, that's the magnitude. Let's try something else. Let's say we look at, I don't know, minus 4, let's say, this guy. So I gave you the bit pattern 1, 1, 0, 0. We realize it's a negative number. So first thing we do is we take the ones complement. So we take the ones complement, that becomes 0, 0, 1, 1. We add, uh, uh, so this is taking ones complement, and then we do a plus 1 to it, and that would give us 0, 1, 0, 0, which is, again, 4, positive 4. So to get the magnitude, our formula becomes, if the number is positive, it is as is. If the number is negative, take the ones complement and add 1 to it. Taking the 1's complement and adding 1 is taking is equivalent to taking 2's complement. What gate would you use to take the 1's complement? Yeah, right? I mean, it's just not, okay. So, uh, um, uh, so essentially, it basically says, look at the sign bit. If the sign bit is 0, pass the number as is to the output. If the sign bit is 1, invert the number and add 1 to it, which you can do by making give, giving it an adder, okay? And that way you can get the magnitude out of it. So now let's go back to this slide. So uh, the nice thing that works out now is that, so let's say I want to do um, x minus y. That is the same as saying x plus minus y, which is the same as saying x plus 2 to the power n minus y modulo 2n, because I'm just adding to the power n and I'm doing modulo 2n. Remember, our n bit adder is doing a modulo n, modulo 2n addition, right? Whenever our original n bit adder that we had designed previously, it if you ignore the final carry out, then it's always doing a modulo 2 in adder addition. Does everyone agree with that? Like if you take your 4-bit adder, previously we were when we were calculating, we were getting 4 bits and then we were getting a final carry out. If you ignore that carry out, then you are really doing modulo 16 addition with that 4-bit adder. So me adding this stuff out here to power n doesn't really make any difference because everything is modulo 2 n. So the net effect of that is that, uh, uh, subtraction, addition, and all can be done with the adder we have already designed. I, so if I have two complement numbers, when I'm adding them, my the same adder which we have already designed already does the addition for them. The only difference is that previously we were treating the n bits as n bits of positive binary number only, whereas now I'm treating the same n bits as n bits of two complement number but it's exactly the same ad adder which will do the trick. And we already saw, uh, I walked you through how we can negate a number. Negating a number means complement, uh, if it is, uh, well, negating a number means complement it and add one to it, okay? So let's see out here, four minus three in this example is going to be four is going to be zero, one, zero, zero. Minus this number minus three, uh, uh, basically, it would get represented as 16 minus 3 mod 16, that's the 2's complement part, which is 15 minus 3 plus 1, so it expands it out, you get 0, 0, 0, 1, you kind of walk through it. So beauty of 2's complement is I didn't need to design any new circuit. My same adder that we previously designed works as an adder for n bit 2's complement numbers also. Now. And I also talked about that how you can take, how can how you can negate a number by uh, taking it, by 
inverting it and then adding one to it. So let's talk about now, I want to design a subtractor for two's complement numbers. So I want to do A minus B, where A and B are two's complement numbers. And I give you a standard adder and any other case you want. How would you do this? So remember, we talked about that an adder acts as a adder for two's complement numbers also. And we talked about that how I can negate a number. I can negate a number by inverting it and adding one to it. Using these two facts, can you design a subtractor? Um, invert B and then add A and B to the two. Right. So A minus B can be, so let me kind of, insert a page and then kind of work through it. So fact one, This is fact number one. Fact number two. Is it, is it n minus b or n minus b? n bit adder acts as adder for n bit two's complement numbers. Fact number two is that minus a is equal to invert the binary representation of a and then you add one to it where A is two's complement. And I want to create a subtractor using these two facts. So, so um, should, should we have to say like if A was already negative, then inverting it, uh, we would lose that bit because no, that doesn't matter whether A is negative or positive. Its negation is always going to be in two's complement. It's going, always going to be invert A plus one. Right, but with limited bit precision, you would lose because the range is not. Okay, so uh, let's come to that in a moment. Okay, uh, but let's 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 stick with this. So so now let's say I have an adder. This is a good old adder can add two numbers, two numbers if, we, if they were standard binary positive numbers. But I want to make this add, and I and let's say I want to use this adder as a two's complement adder, great, I can use it as is, I need, don't need to do anything, okay, the, I'm only reinterpreting my numbers. But I want to make it act like a subtractor. So the deal was that A minus B is the same as A plus minus B. And a plus minus b, so minus b becomes, I invert a, sorry, I invert b and add 1 to it, right? So I what I really want to do is I want to do a plus invert of whatever, uh, sorry, in, uh, invert of whatever, so a minus b is the same as a plus invert b plus 1. What gate lets me invert a number? A NOT gate certainly does, right? So I can put a, um, you know, so let's say I only wanted a subtractor. So I can, instead of putting B like this, I can put a B like this. And I want to add one to this also. So what I can do is, in the least significant bit, I can use a full adder and feed a one out here. So I can modify my adder so that instead of using a half adder in the least bit, it uses a full adder and now I have an extra input I can provide and this is my subtractor. This is a two's complement subtractor. <coughs> Raise your hands if you're lost. Okay, so let's, let's, let's. So, uh, 
let's go back. So, uh, for, firstly, let's go back to two's complement definition. Representing a two's complement of a number is essentially subtracting that number from two to the power n. So, the number, uh, and this lets us represent negative numbers because I can take minus x and I will represent it as 2 to the power n minus x and that gives us, gives rise to this wheel that we had where using 4 bits I can represent all the positive numbers through 1, 1, 1, 0 through 7 and then to represent let's say 6 I have to do 2 to the power n minus 6 which is another way of saying complement this and add 1 so it would be 1, 0, 0, 1 plus 1 which is 1, 0, 1, 0, and which is what you see out here. So, um, <coughs> I take this guy to find out uh, what minus 6 would be. I take this guy, I subtract it from 2 to the power n. 2 to the power n is 1 followed by 4 zeros. That's the number 16, which is the same as 15 plus 1. So, I... Uh, I invert this guy because subtracting 0, 1, 1, 0 from 1, 1, 1, 1 is basically inverting each bit individually. So I get 1, this, these 1, 0, 0, 1, and then we add 1 to it, which eats us 1, 0, 1, 0. So that's what we get out here. And you can systematically map it for everything. Uh, so these bit patterns, which are starting with 1, correspond to negative numbers. The next point I made was that our regular adder, our regular 4-bit adder, which we had designed to add 4-bit positive binary numbers, also acts as an adder for 4-bit 2's complement numbers. And that we can verify. So let's say, for example, I do 2 plus 3, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 1, and I feed them into my good old adder, I'm going to get uh, in this particular case, 0, 1, 0, 1, which is the number 5. So, two positive numbers we can clearly add this way. What about, let's say I'm trying to add a positive number and a negative number. So, let's say I try to add 4 with minus 4. Let's take that. So, 4 is represented as, so let's say I'm doing 4 and I'm going to add minus 4 to it. 4 is 0, 1, 0, 0. And on our 2's complement scale, minus 4 is 1, 1, 0, 0. Now let's add them, but add them as if they were standard binary numbers. So I'm going to get 0, 0, 1 plus 1 is 0, 1 plus 1 is 0, and I ignore the carry out. And see, I'm getting 0, 0, 0, 0, which is a number 0 as one would expect. Let's take something else. Suggest to me something. What do you want me to add? Negative 1 and 3, okay. So negative 1 is 1, 1, 1, 1, and 3 is 0, 0, 1, 1, and my, so this is negative 1, uh, and this is 3. I add them, so 1 plus 1 is 0, carry of 1, 1 plus 1 plus 1, 1, carry of 1, 1 plus 1, 0, 1 plus 1, 0, and I throw out the carry out. I don't wo worry about it. I get 0, 0, 1, 0, which is the number 2, which is as I would expect. Okay. Let's try two negative numbers, right? I mean, if my claim is true for two negative numbers, it would also hold true. So let's take, uh, uh, the only thing we have to watch out is that there should not be any overflow, right? I mean, my two negative numbers should not exceed, should not be smaller than minus 8. So let's look at, let's say, minus 3, and uh, let's try minus 3, which is 1, 1, 0, 1, and let's take minus 4 which is 1, 1, 0, 0. And I'm adding them. So it's 1 plus 0 is 1, 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry of 1, 1 plus 1, 1, and there's a carry out which I ignore, 1, 0, 0, 1. And what is 1, 0, 0, 1? The number minus 7. Okay? And uh, so you can try it whichever way. You add minus 4, uh, plus minus 4, you will get 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, so, the thing is, just our standard, um, uh, we're kind of going back and forth on thinking about the same bits in two different ways, 
right? So what we're basically saying is these four bits, I think of as two's complement. But then when I'm adding them, I'm feeding them to my regular binary adder. There is no such special thing as a two's complement adder there. Okay, it's just a regular binary adder. I'm thinking them, thinking of them as just regular binary numbers for, for the moment. I do my addition. I throw out the carry out. I'm getting a four bit number. And then I reinterpret that four bit output as an, a two's complement number. And it all magically adds up. And all of that is happening because they're all residing in this modulo to the power n wheel. Okay, so my regular adder functions as a two's complement adder also. Okay, the only thing obviously is that I am interpreting these input patterns differently now, right? I mean, the number 1011 is no more 11 as it would be in a standard binary adder, but I interpret it as minus 5. Okay, so and given such a binary, given such an adder, then the next assertion that I'm making is that uh, I can always make a subtractor for two's complement numbers by making use of the fact that negating a number, negating a two's complement number is the same as taking its two's complement again. And taking a two's complement is the same as inverting the bit pattern and adding one to it. So I can take my adder and then I want to do A minus B where A and B I'm interpreting as two's complement number. So I feed A to the one input of the adder and to the other input I feed B with an invert inversion and put in a one out here. And that will implement A plus one's complement of B plus one, which is the same as A minus B, okay, two's complement. So now I have a two's complement there. Uh, I have a two's complement subtractor, two's complement adder I already had, who all are still lost, yeah, question. So, what I was saying before is like, if you were to put in negative eight for B, the system would fail. Okay, so let's see what happens. What is negative eight, um, uh, if I were to take a two's complement of it, right? So, so if I go back out here, so negative 8 is 1, 0, 0. I negate it. So I do the inversion and I add 1 to it. I will get back 1, 0, 0 where the system is failing because I cannot represent the number positive 8. Okay. So two's complement number, I cannot. Uh, so you'll face the same problem out here. Let's say I add. 1 plus 7, right? So 1 is 0, 0, 0, 1, 7 is 0, 1, 1, 1. I add them, I get the number 1, 0, 0, 0, but that in two's complement I interpret as minus 8. So we say that there is an overflow happening now. I cannot add uh, 1 plus 7 and stay within four bits of two's complement. I have to introduce some extra bits to be able to represent it. Likewise, I cannot add minus 6 plus minus 7 because that would require me to represent minus 13, which I cannot represent out here. I will get some four bits, but it would lie somewhere out here to be a bogus result. So very important that uh, when you're adding or subtracting, you be careful. one has to be careful about whether an overflow or underflow is happening, whether you're ending up with a result which is too positive, that is higher than 7, or too negative, namely smaller than minus 8. And we'll talk about how one can do that in probably next class. Uh, how are we doing in time? We are five minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, so I cannot represent two po uh, numbers which are too large or too small. There is a limit in which I can represent numbers. But kind of a subtle thing out here, and I know it's a tricky concept, so um, I want to spend time on that, which is it's the very same adder circuit, which earlier on we developed to add two n bit standard binary numbers, which suddenly magically also work out for our two's complement numbers. And the reason they work out is because of this uh, modulo property. Remember the way we are doing two's complement numbers is taking a two's complement is two to the power n minus x, right? So we are doing modulo arithmetic and that magically kind of works out out here. So x plus minus y is the same as x plus 
this entity, which is actually nothing but uh, the two's complement of the numbers. So it's this equation out here, which is very key out here. Okay, so same adder works, and then further with the insight that uh, taking two's complement uh, is the same as uh, negating a number. Uh, so actually, let's let's try that out here also. Let's take the number one one zero zero. I take its two's complement. It would be zero zero one one plus one, which is zero one zero zero, which is four. And you can try whichever way that. So if I have a positive number, I take its two's complement. I'll get the corresponding negative number. If I have the negative number, I take its two's complement. I will get the corresponding positive number. So it all kind of just sort of fits in that way. Um, Let's say I want to make a piece of hardware which can do both addition and subtraction. And I give you a control input. I basically say, if this input is 0, do an addition, a plus b. If this input is uh, 1, do a subtraction. OK, so what I want to do is, let's So what I want to do is I want to design a circuit called add or subtract. And what, so in a sense, what it is doing is it's taking A, B, and let's say it is an input called S. And what it should do is out is equal to A plus B if S is equal to 0, and it's A minus B if S equal to 1. That's what I want to do. So it's a module which can do plus b or minus a plus b or a minus b depending upon what I do. How would you design this? Lots of hand this time. I'll try you. Yeah. Say it again. Okay. So firstly, well, you don't have to worry about whether b is negative number or not, right? I mean, subtractor Right, but I have to do the two's complement of B. So I did that out here. So somehow what I need to do is whenever S is high, I have to do this. And whenever S is low, I should just act, make it act as a standard adder. Uh, uh, that is, there should be no inversion and there should be zero out here. So now, can you do it? You want to try? Uh, yeah. um, could you put a SOR gate on every channel of B with the second argument being S? And then additionally have a full adder sequence on the output of that, which takes S, um, and then have that go into the full adder with A. Actually, you don't even need to do that. You just feed S out here. Think of here I have made multiple copies of S, okay? So what, what I'm doing out here is I'm, ex, I'm XORing B with S. If S is 0, B will flow through. If S is high, I will get B inversion out here. And if S is high, I'm feeding a 1 out here. If S is 0, I'm feeding a 0 out here. So whenever S is 0, this circuit looks like a A and B are getting added. And whenever S is high, then it would be as if A plus <coughs> inversion of B plus 1 is happening, which is the same as A minus B, right? So consider S equal to 0. Then this circuit would behave like this, A, B, 0. Because I'm feeding in the carry chain out here, right? I mean, I'm making, uh, I've created this carry in the whole adder, which I can put a 1 out there, OK? So if S is high, then this is acting as if I have A, I have B with an invert, and I have a 1. And this is the same as A minus B, this is the same as A plus B. Okay, so I can create uh, multiple arithmetic operations out of the same module uh, with the, just some additional gates kind of thrown in. Uh, I'm going to stop out here and uh, TAs will go over this material again. I'll also do another recap next week. Uh, this this is sort of tricky, tricky material.
But what I would really urge you to do is to read up on Tooth Complement and its properties. It's very important that you be extremely comfortable with how these numbers work. They are kind of unusual, but uh, they have some magical properties as well.